The Passion of Jesus I Was Thinking of You Written by Miss Lorianne Matisse Read for you by Chiquito Jokin Crasto Scene 14 Setting Back at Pilots Luke Chapter 23 Verses 13 to 25 Pilate exhaled a deep sigh of dismay when he witnessed the band of soldiers leading me, beaten and worn, back through the gate. He did not lift his eyes to meet me. At this moment, he did not relish his position as governor. He felt somewhat annoyed, but saddened, that his decision to pass the responsibility of my trial to Herod had backfired. Back to square one, he thought. Why can't these Jewish leaders ease up on this carpenter? He does not seem to be a threat to their position, nor is he a threat to me. Every eye of the crowd was upon him. The pressure of their stare was nothing compared to mine. He could feel me looking at him, peering into him, through him, piercing through to his very intentions, dividing between soul and spirit, and discerning the thoughts of his heart, with such precision as one could divide bone from marrow. For after all, I am the Word of God, the Word made into flesh, the living Torah. The truth of the Word burned through me, a laser beam of light seared through my eyes. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word who was with God, and was God, who was born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but born of God, stood before Pilate, full of grace and truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through me, the Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 17. Pilate thought, that he stood as judge in the judgment seat. But I was in the position of judge, but I came not to judge him, but to save him. With my compelling, compassionate eyes, I hoped to persuade him not to listen to public opinion, nor to the high council of Caiaphas. I hoped beyond hope that he might pay attention to the beat of his own heart. Or if not that, at least give serious heed to his wife's dream. Pilate remembered the rumours floating around of John the Baptist. He had heard that when John baptised this Jesus of Nazareth, he cried out, This is he whom I told you about, he who was coming after me, but is preferred before me. John chapter 1 verse 15 Pilate wondered why Herod decided to behead this man. What could he have done wrong? What could this man, Jesus, standing before me now have done wrong? They both seemed like religious zealots. Is that a bad thing? Jesus fed people and healed them. Neither one was violent or rude, nor had they stolen anything or caused a riot. The crowd did not notice Pilate's jaw tighten and his facial muscles flinch while he reflected on the beheading of John the Baptist. But I noticed. He certainly did not want to share in the responsibility of putting innocent men to death. In fact, he did not even desire responsibility per se. No, it was political power that he enjoyed, for he had a weak spine after all. Many politicians will follow suit over many generations. A good one is rare. Now that I stood before him, looking more like a tortured criminal than the son of God, Pilate's political mind began to kick into place, rather than a mind of reason. Herod sent him away. Maybe Herod knows something I don't know. He nor I are well versed in the Jewish religion. If the leaders of the Torah are shouting to condemn this man, then perhaps Herod is right. What's one more criminal put to death? 
Herod and I will become friends after this, Pilate thought. We can commiserate together, and perhaps we will be even more powerful. Politicians feed off each other when their agendas line up. They hadn't thought of being friends with Herod before. In fact, they were not close at all, and rarely, if ever, did they agree. Now, faced with a common factor of guilt, he felt he might feel more comfortable in a group, even a group of two. Get on with it! The chief scribes bellowed outside the gate. He has committed blasphemy. He says he is the son of God. With the clamor of the priests, Pilate snapped out of his dream state, where he was bolstering his career bubble with Herod's liaison. He deliberated once again. I have examined him and find no basis for your charge against him. Neither has Herod found any fault in him. He sent him back to me because he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Luke chapter 23 verse 4 The shouting of the crowd grew very loud at this time. They accompanied the priests now. As they continued to ooze their grumbling to irritate the festering sore they had created. The cancerous rumbling now planted in the stomach of the hungry mob would not stop until they were satisfied by devouring something or someone that day. Crowds are never satisfied because they are not a being but a collective. A collective does not have a conscience. Mobs today and throughout time cannot be trusted. Why so early in the morning? Pilate moaned. Why? Why must we rush these matters? Why today on Passover? He looked upon his prisoner. Not into my eyes, no, but onto my frail looking human body, bleeding and trembling, starving and sleep deprived, contrasted with the angry mob. I resembled a small white lamb surrounded by a hungry pack of wolves. Pilate felt the pressure of the Sanhedrin and the council. He felt the pressure of the venomous crowd. He felt he was in a boxing match with fate, and he knew he was beginning to be backed into the ropes. He was unwilling to step out of the ring for fear he would appear soft and not at all like the ruthless Roman governor of Judea, which was, of course, his reputation. Look at me. I plead with my eyes. Look into my eyes. I knew Pilate when he was a boy, so petite, so frail. He was not cut out to be a soldier. He got pushed around by the bigger boys, bullied even. But he was extremely smart, and he knew he could succeed in politics if he used his mouth wisely. The scene set before him this morning, however, did not seem like a political matter. Why is this decision falling on me? Just because the Jews cannot punish their own? He thought to himself again, This is madness! As he was thinking these thoughts, I was thinking of him, as I was thinking of you. Often, the structure of a system or organization will box you into a corner, just as Pilate felt boxed into a corner now. When you are up against the ropes, forced to make a life-changing decision based on your own integrity or giving in to a loud group of bullies like Pilate, I hope you will look to me. I hope you will see the truth standing before you outside the religious or governmental system and I hope you will stand up for yourself, for me, and choose truth. I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. I know Pilate will not make the right decision, but you can. You can see beyond the rhetoric, beyond the chaos of this world. Choose me. Choose the narrow path of righteousness which leads to eternal life. Pilate was frustrated this morning by the system and hierarchy of the church and state. Yet he was fully aware that the Jewish leaders could not condemn me to death by execution at this time unless they stoned me. Jus gladii. 
supreme jurisdiction belonged only to Rome. The priests had an ultimate agenda. They were determined to push for a formal decision by the Romans, in order to trace the final decision in a clear line of command, in a nutshell, so they could pass the blood from their hands to the Romans. As I have stated, the Jewish leaders stayed outside of the judgment hall, so they would not be defiled. I knew their reasoning, and to them it made such sense. They knew that contact with a Gentile meant defilement, as the heathens were unclean, so they rationalized even to the point of ridiculousness. To maintain cleanliness as the Passover approached, the religious leaders avoided contact with Gentiles, yet were pleased to send their Messiah into the unclean arena. I had said to them, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! for you are like whitewashed sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Matthew chapter 23 verse 27 Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The hypocrisy of the religious leaders who accused me of blasphemy is not unlike many hypocritical religious leaders who will lead the organized church throughout centuries. Wolves in sheep's clothing, or wolves in shepherd's clothing. Even worse, tradition will rule, greed will reign. Many true believers and followers of me, Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world, will be beaten, scourged, mocked, burned at the stake, and even hung on a cross. Over and over, I will be set on the judgment seat and condemned to death, through each precious martyr who will suffer with me and die with me. They who suffer with me will reign with me, but those who lie and make a lie, who rule the false church, will be forever shut out of my kingdom. My kingdom is built with living stones. Hearts of flesh who are willing to identify with me in my death and thus live with me forever. The true church throughout history will be invisible to most for I look on the heart of mankind, not on the outside. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7 I see your heart today, for I was thinking of you just as I am thinking of you now at the trial. The trial of your faith is so very precious and valuable to me. As you follow me, along an often solitary path. At times, no one will understand, just as no one in the crowd understands me today. Not one of them understood that the one standing before them is the way, the truth, and the life, the Messiah and Savior of the whole world. What hypocrisy! To be preoccupied with a meaningless tradition while attempting to execute the Son of the living God. The religious leaders maintained a fastidious commitment to their religion while seeking to kill the source of their religion, their very own awaited Messiah. They misunderstood me today, and will misunderstand me for thousands of years until I come again, and they will see me and know that it is I whom they have pierced. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10, Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Wait, hold on. Perhaps there is a way out of this. Pilate suddenly remembered one of their Roman customs. He sighed a great sigh of relief. Today, on Passover, Pilate could release one prisoner who was sentenced to die. Surely they will call for the release of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, whom I can find no fault with, he encouraged himself. This will be my answer. I will flog him and let him go. But as he was summing up his own conclusion, which would exonerate him from this filthy plot, the accusations from the Sanhedrins escalated along with angry shouts from the crowd. I could barely hear him above the noise of the crowd when Pilate said, So you are a king? I responded, You say I am a king. Actually, 
I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them, He is not guilty of any crime. You have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? John chapter 18, verses 37 to 39. For a split second, there was silence, and the space and time continuum seemed to stop. You could have heard a pin drop in the huge stadium. Then, one single voice in the crowd shrieked, Release to us Barabbas! That one voice pierced my ear. I knew the person from whom that voice originated. Just as I know your voice, I had created the person, knit him together in secret in his mother's womb. I had given him his unique voice, yet I had also given him a choice, as I have given to each person, as I have given to you. This one voice was loud enough to incite the crowd like a spark from one match carelessly thrown to the ground that ignites a ferocious forest fire. As it is with a wild fire, the rest of the crowd savagely joined in with a violent chant that would change the course of all human history. Release to us, Barabbas! Release to us, Barabbas! My treasured followers were completely scattered by now. The scene exploded into a mob scene. Mobs are unpredictable, but I was not afraid. I knew the rant of this ugly crowd would only get louder. My disciples cowered in fear. They could not have imagined their leader being treated in this manner. I do not blame them for their fear. I do not blame them for fleeing. I was thinking of them, just as I am thinking of you now. When you are in a crowd of people who mock my existence, who would ridicule you if you dare say that you are a follower of me, I know there will be times when you shrink back with fear. I am praying for you. I pray that you will overcome the fear with faith, because greater am I who are in you than the shouts of a noisy crowd. I wanted to hush each person in the crowd. I wanted to silence their demands for their own sake. Some of them had been healed by me. Some had been raised to life and delivered from evil spirits. But mobs can be hideous, and one revolting voice can incite a riot, while softer voices can be muffled under the weight of the others. Dark hearts find comfort in crowds. A pure heart can stand alone, just as Stephen, my disciple, will stand alone when he becomes the first martyr, stoned to death by those who claimed to be my own. Surely those stoning him will be mesmerized and ashamed when they behold his face shining towards my Father in heaven as the stones are being hurled at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, will look up to heaven and see the glory of God, and me, Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 7 verse 5 My kingdom is not of this world. Throughout many years of history, after my death and resurrection, there will be martyrs such as Stephen, who will lay down their lives to build the foundation of the church the true living church. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am present among them. My living church will be built on the blood of the martyrs. I already knew what Stephen would say to the evil hearts of the Sanhedrin who are condemning me to death now. Stephen will say, Look, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 7 verse 55. And I already knew what the leaders would do. At this, the teachers and leaders of the Torah 
covered their ears, and, yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Acts chapter 7, verses 58 to 60 Of course he will not fall asleep. He will come to me. His martyrdom, as I have predicted it, fills me with love for him now and gives me courage to continue today on the path of suffering. For all of those who, like Stephen, will give their lives for me, also give me courage to press on, as I give them courage by completing my mission. I will die for this mob, and for the one voice who incited the riot, so that if ever you have incited a riot, or been part of a mob which caused an innocent to die, an innocent will die in your place. Me. When the mob scene is over, and you are left alone with blood-stained hands, all you need to do is ask for forgiveness. Turn from your wicked way, and you will be forgiven. For I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. Or, if you are the one who are being trampled by a mob, you have a Lord who has suffered the same. I love all of my own. I give my life for the whole world. But those who come to me, I will make a covenant with my blood, dearly beloved, and sealed with me forever. I was momentarily lost in my thoughts of these precious souls, all who would love me throughout thousands of years, when suddenly, rudely, I was forced to return to the current scene. Pilate proceeded to invoke the crowd again to let me go. Neither I nor Herod have found anything done by this man that is worthy of death. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Even though the chastisement meant thirty-nine lashes of the most excoriating pain which could be inflicted on a human being, the mob responded with a tidal wave of disappointment. They booed even louder, with their angry voices, tongues waving in the air as a whip being tossed haphazardly, like confetti. Away with this man! Release unto us Barabbas! 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 I could hear them chant, Release unto us Barabbas! Barabbas was just a man, a common criminal. I knew what he had done. He was not worse than any man. In fact, those who say they are religious but have hearts darkened by evil are just as bad as the Barabbases of the world. Some are even worse. Barabbas was, of course, happy and relieved to be chosen by the crowd. I knew he would be, and I was also happy for him. I was thinking of him, just as I was thinking of you just as I am thinking of you now. When you are in a tough predicament, perhaps by your own doing, I will release you. Barabbas' name meant son of the father, and truly he is a son to the same degree as anyone. If Barabbas had called out to me for forgiveness, he would have had it, just as you will receive my forgiveness when you have committed a common crime or a crime of the heart, if only you call upon my name. I am the scapegoat for Barabbas today, just as I will be your scapegoat. My mind is reeling now. The noise of the crowd is deafening. There is a smell of sulphur in the air, emitting from the sins of angry men and women, very unlike the sweet smell of incense radiating from the prayers of humble servants like Mary. With one word from my mouth, I could slaughter my captors or cause them to be ousted by a giant wind. I could burn them with fire, 
I could cause an earthquake to open up the ground and swallow them. But I was thinking of them. They needed a savior. And I was, I am, the only one who could cover their sins. I was thinking of you. If you are rushed along with an angry mob, perhaps to make the wrong decision or choose the wrong savior, when you realize what you have done, and you need atonement for your sins, you have me, condemned to die for you. When the crowd has dispersed and you are alone in your closet, scared and frail, I will break my body for you and cover you with my blood. I pray you will find a place of silence away from the crowd. Step away from an angry mob before you are swept out to sea by the current tide of public opinion. I was thinking of you, as I am thinking of you now. Eve's Memoirs and Other Books and Art by Laurie Matisse, available at www.evesmemoirs.com www.lauriematisse.com www.mysticcenter.com Laurie's blog, Weaving Light lauriematisseblog.wordpress.com For information on Eve the Musical, contact lauriematisse at gmail.com End Times Info www.mysticcenter.com www.calculatingthelast7.com Support the work of translating this book into other languages. HTTPS colon two forward slashes www.patreon.com forward slash Laurie Matisse